Uh, welcome everybody. Our speaker today is Serge Gia, uh, who's visiting uh, Miami. He'll be here tomorrow. If you guys would like to chat with him, just let me know. He's in the visitor's office uh, on the third floor. Serge wears many hats, and so I had to actually print them out to actually read them. He's currently the professor of statistics at University College London. Uh, he also holds a joint chair uh, with the Met Office in Data Science for Weather and Climate. Uh, he was a group leader at the Alan Turing Institute and a fellow of the Leverhulme uh, Institute as well. Trust. <laughs> Trust. Uh, he's working at the intersection of scientific computing, big data, and uh, statistical learning and numerical modeling. So it's actually the trifecta of, of modern science. So today he's gonna tell us about his work on quantifying uncertainties in tsunami modeling. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's, it's a wonderful place. Uh, so indeed I work at uh, University College London, London, which goes by UCL. Uh, not UCLA or whatever, so it's UCL, and uh, it's not University College of London, it's University College London. And uh, my department is statistical science, but I'm split with the Advanced Research Computing Center, ARC, which is a new entity, and I'm going to advertise, uh, because advertise the fact that we have jobs, and very nice jobs, permanent jobs, where you have a career as a so-called research software engineer, research infrastructure developer, research data scientist, research data stu steward, but with a mix with research, uh, not just you know service, uh, uh, helping scientists, but becoming yourself uh, a scientist. So we have an evergreen advert with nine posts every year for the next, next few years, plus the turnover, so please go on the website, I should bet it like, in, and if, you, if, if you're interested in a career in advanced research computing. Uh, we hire people who have you know, uh, expertise in uh, ocean science, but uh, physics or whatever, biology, etc. many projects. The Met Office is uh, supporting my, my chair right now, but I'm not going to talk about uh, weather and climate <laughs> uh, today. I'm going to talk about tsunami. So, uh, first, I'm going to advertise the Alan Turing Institute, and they funded uh, my project, the fellowship, as well. Maybe I can use the, the mouse. So, what is the Alan Turing Institute? It's the National Institute in the UK for Data Science and AI, and it supports projects that reach to other sciences. Uh, we have uh, programs on uh, data science for science, for you know health, for etc. etc. So. Uh, at the beginning, it was only five universities, the usual ones, the Warwick, UCL, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, and Edinburgh, and now it's uh, more. So here we have colleagues from even Exeter, uh, Warwick, uh, we have uh, research software engineers from the, from the Turing Institute, which has a very strong group as well, my, my post postdocs here and my PhD student. So we had a project on uh, building what's called surrogates. and. Or, or emulators, uh, and multi multi physics, multi scale. So papers are finally coming out. But I'm not going to do, give a talk on statistics. I'm going to give a talk on the use of it for the for the for the for tsunamis. So we have actually continuing funding. We have the first uh, big project, about one million pounds, with a colleague um, on on UQ for uh, cross cutting applications. So we 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 do work on weather and climate, we do uh, work on other, other sciences such as nuclear fusion and medicine, etc. The methods can be similar. The second project just ended. Last week I met the funders to prove that we did <laughs> what we were supposed to do. Uh, so this is a very interesting project on future uh, tsunamis in Indonesia, where we mix, and I will talk about that at the end, we mix uh, economics with hazard science. So we do the whole end-to-end -end work of determining the impact of tsunamis on people. And the last uh, funding, it's not a big funding, it's more like network funding, 26 countries together. I was part of the team that put it together, um, but I'm not leading it. I'm leading the work, uh, working group on, 
on uncertainty. So this is a what's called a cost action. It's beyond the EU actually. The UK is it, it, it was established before the UK even joined the EU, etc. So the this is network funding to promote and disseminate. And we, we just wrote a paper on gaps, and we're writing a cookbook right now <laughs> on methods. And you know, so this is nice. So I'm going to scare you first with the uh, with the complexity of a, what of tsunami. A risk assessment. I'm going to talk about the blue part. It's, I, don't, I cannot imagine that you can read this, but this is what's needed to do a tsunami risk assessment, and here is mostly the hazard. So bathymetric data, the, the seafloor elevation, uh, computing the propagation, the generation first, the propagation of the tsunami, the inundation of the tsunami, the uh, you can even have uh, gauges, so that's, that's something I won't talk about, but I will talk with Mohamed about, about data simulation. So when you have information, observations from either buoys, even satellites, we have a paper that I won't talk about today, but that, published, that was published last year on detecting tsunamis with, with satellites, with GPS satellites. And then uh, inundation, I just talked about that, and the footprint. So this is a key point, a key uh, box that I will discuss today, and a little bit on damage calculation. So the impact on buildings or people, and the loss, and then uh, there's a lot more on uh, historical or geological, geological evidence and uh, and and the mitigation, uh, engineering. So th there are many aspects to tsunami risk. Obviously. I'm going to ju jump into statistics, but uh, don't worry, I'll go fast on these slides. I'll just focus on the picture now. So these computer models, I will, I will show you um, model outputs later on. These computer models that propagate the tsunami, so from, from the generation to the inundation, are typically shallow water equations and solving shallow water equations that are uh, quite, uh, especially at high resolution, that are quite expensive to run. So you want to replace the computer model by a surrogate, by a, a statistical emulator that mimics the input-output relationship of the computer model. And this type of surrogate needs to you know, stick to the computer model, model outputs, input-outputs that you train the emulator on. So that's these red points here. So this is an example, a silly example. That's one-dimensional input, one-dimensional output. This function is x sine x. It's not a complex computer model like a tsunami model. But just to illustrate, and so you condition uh, the what's called Gaussian process, so this uh, stochastic process that represents the input-output relationship, you condition it on the, uh, the points that you have exercised the model on. So you exercise the model, you collect one point, two points, three points, four points, five points, and then you build a, uh, uh, an approximation of the computer model. And what's nice in the Gaussian process idea is that you have uncertainty about this prediction. So, you know, you know that you know if you make a prediction here in the middle here, you're far away from other points. You may you may make a large mistake. But you know also that it's dangerous to extrapolate. If you see my mouse, that's you know, everything uh, becomes a bit wide. So you have to uh, create a design of a computer experiment that that encapsulates the examples that you are going to then use for prediction. You fit and then you predict. I'm not going to say more, so I'm going to skip those slides, maybe we can come back uh, on it, but it's the, the techniques of doing the Gaussian process, the mean function, the covariance function, so many details about the, the, the properties and, the, and the, the difficulties in fitting this, so I'm going to skip that, the, those slides, but it's possible to fit these with, with maximum likelihood, the Bayesian method, fine. The, maybe the last slide, I, I can dwell a little bit on it. The, the one point is that it, it's quite uh, expensive. N cube, uh, where N is the kind of the number of uh, data points that you collect uh, input output, especially if you have multiple outputs, multiple locations where you want to fit a, a Gaussian process. So uh, many options are there. It's dimension reduction of the inputs. We published a paper in Siam Journal of UQ. Uh, on this, smaller designs, sequential designs that we used actually in, in the later part of my talk, later on, uh, on tsunamis. Uh, and hardware, we're looking at uh, funny hardware, uh, FPGAs, if you have ever heard of that. Uh, we are struggling with that. At Turing, we, we had a project on this, but now we're looking at other, so there's a lot of uh, new exotic hardware out there. So GPUs we use, obviously. We, we already accelerated in GPUs. It's, 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 it's recent, but you know, for predictions, it's much better. 
But there are other, I don't know if you heard of Samba Nova or Graphcore, they are very interesting. You know, we keep meeting those companies that create new chips that are uh, not as fancy as FPGAs. FPGAs are chips that can be redesigned completely to optimize your algorithm. So you redesign completely the chip to uh, pipeline, to paralyze your computations efficiently. But that I'm not yet successful, despite having, uh, having had help from research software engineers for some time, research developers also, wherever. Uh, uh, new approaches in linear algebra. We, we created a work, we had a workshop in 2019, and uh, there are other workshops that you can go online if you're interested in that topic. But this is more statistic, computational statistics, so I skip that. Let me go back to the ocean, or uh, the sea, actually, the Arabian Sea. So the, I'm going to look at multiple examples of uh, an application of uh, surrogate modeling to the um, the modeling of future. Uh, tsunamis in some, uh, in two classes of, of examples. So one is uh, landslides and one is earthquakes. So the majority of, I mean, 94% uh, of the of the tsunamis are generated by earthquakes. 6% maybe by by landslides. The landslides can be uh, more troublesome. You remember 2018 uh, in uh, in uh, Indonesia. In 2018, there were two major. Oh, not major, but two uh, uh, serious uh, tsunamis. One in September, which was due to an earthquake, uh, or was it in Berlin? Yeah, and in, in December by uh, Krakatau, that's uh, this volcano that collapsed and created this uh, this landslide. I mean, it's a volcanic driven, but it's a landslide. So, uh, in this paper, we published in uh, page off in 2019. We looked at the Indus Canyon, the Indus that gave the name of India, right? Uh, so Hindustan. So uh, it, it, you see the canyon here, and it's quite deep, and there's evidence of past landslides. So we modeled the landslides that were possibly originating from there. So that's the work of my postdoc, uh, Dimitris and Manidu, mostly. And you can see the uh, all sorts of slices in all directions here but we are going to focus on, on that location. So one location only. One location, the risk for one location only. And then we created uh, virtual gauges when we simulated, so I don't know if I say which simulator I used, but I'll, I'll say, it. oops, sorry. Uh, it's a Japanese model called Jaguars, which is dispersive. So the, the landslides are a, a bit more complex to model than earthquakes because they have this uh, very uh, almost point-wise uh, origin, and they, they disperse uh, quite quickly. So these are the gauges. We use multiple levels of cells. And then what we did uh, is create as input at this location the thickness, the width, the depth, and the distance traveled of the landslide. So if you have a thick landslide with a large width and uh, you know. A, uh, at a low depth and uh, it travels a lot, then obviously you'll have a very large landslide. And then we have many uh, other so, so the blue graphs are the uncertainty in these four landslide parameters? Exactly, exactly. So I didn't yet explain that I trained an emulator, but these are actually, this is a very good question because uh, the uncertainty about the uncertainty is quite big, right? Expert knowledge has to be gathered to create such such uh, uh, such uh, distributions of the inputs, we use beta distributions here because they fit into an interval and they look nice because they are they go to zero at the end. By the way, why should they? You know, if you use a uniform distribution, you can claim that oh, I'm agnostic about the about the the possible variation in this parameter. Well, it's not an agnostic, 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 oh, agnostic statement that much because if you use a uniform distribution, you're actually saying something. You're saying it's the same probability here and there. Well, so let's go for, I mean, it's a very good question. Expert, I have not, there's, there's actually a um, very nice uh, work by the University of Sheffield. Uh, they have come up with a uh, whole system of gathering experts creating, elicitating uh, information coming out of, of experts, you know. Uh, so expert elicitation is a big, 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 uh, big deal. So this work, 
created by us looking at past events and thinking about the possibility of future events. Obviously, we cannot, a distance travel cannot go beyond 2,000 meters because the, the whole depth is 2,000 meters, etc. And these are the kind of, of, uh, of uh, outputs we get at, this, at these gauges that I just showed you before. Some of these gauges have numbers. Uh, I, can, I cannot recall we, where are they exactly, but these should be very close to the, to the, um, to the source because you know, have a very high speed and, and then they disperse. These are simulated? Uh, simulated. Simulated. And this is the simulation actually in time, a uh, snapshot, sorry. So you can see the, the landslide generated tsunami, the initial wave being created, and, this, and these gauges that receive uh, this information, virtual gauges, and it's all one event. To, in B, you have after 30 minutes, 60 minutes, uh, two hours. You see what's happening? So the propagation happens. Actually, direction is uh, interesting, uh, and speed is, is interesting. Uh, and then if you propagate from the inputs that I showed you before to the outputs, at specific gauges, you can use the emulator. We did about 2,000, I think, uh, predictions, only using typically, I think we used probably 60 runs at the beginning to fit the emulator. These runs are very expensive. We use uh, one part of the cluster at Cambridge that we use, not the GPU part, but the nice landing, the KNL. So these are expensive. It takes 36 hours on one, you know, whatever on a supercomputer, whatever. So, so these are expensive, and therefore we were able to make use of the emulator to go very fast and predict, predict those uh, complex uh, shapes of the outputs. Uh, what's interesting is the fact that actually uh, the, uh, the, the height on the left is the, the three um, histograms on the left are heights. So forget about the, this, the difference H1, H2, is two, two little assumptions. But so, um, not that much height here, but sometimes very, uh, very high velocity. Like, you know, when we talk about meters per second, of beyond two, it's typically what's ca what can unmoor a, a boat, right? I'll show you an example uh, of 2004, actually. So this can be dramatic here if you have uh, shipping activity uh, over there. This, this shipping activity, activity actually there, uh, one of the largest ports of India is nearby. But still, it's not. Uh, it's not. In, in the end, it's, it's not that, that that dangerous. What's more dangerous is the Macron subduction zone. So the Macron subduction zone, the MSZ here. You see that? It's made of uh, multiple segments. And um, uh, in 1945, you see that uh, there was an 8.1. Uh, uh, magnitude uh, earthquake that uh, cr that killed about around 3,000 people. I show you a, a, uh, a newspaper uh, headline on this. So 8.1 uh, is large, and it killed 3,000 people. But the population of uh, Pakistan and India was not the same. Five million people in 1945 were living in Mumbai, now it's 36 million, and many on the shoreline, and many poor people on the shoreline. Uh, you know, vulnerable people. So um, it killed only about 15 people in Mumbai. It reached Mumbai. I'll show you the simulation we did also for Mumbai. Bombay. Uh, but we have mostly worked on Karachi, which is the, uh, the city at the, uh, uh, over here in Pakistan. So, uh, the Macron subduction zone, there's so, some, uh, a nice paper uh, by Smith in 2013 demonstrated that it possibly there would be an 8.7, 9.2. And now we're talking, you know, you know the scale is logarithmic, so, so now we're talking a possibility of uh, very large events. And so we wrote a paper in 2021 using an emulator to propagate this possible uh, uh, future tsunamis to Karachi only we did. So that was the Daily Gazette of 1945 to 28th November. Tidal wave. The India was still, uh, sorry, Pakistan and India were together as united, undivided India before the partition in 1947. Uh, so this, this was a, a, a big problem. By the way, the event that I didn't talk about here is this other event in 2013. Sometimes the earthquakes happen on land. I think 2013 is the one that created uh, an island off the shore of uh, 
of Pakistan people saw in Ireland, <laughs> but that's that, at least it was on shore, so it was not too too energetic. Let's say. So we use this uh, code called Volna that we've worked on. So my colleague Frederic Diaz uh, from Uni University College Dublin and NS UNS Cachan in Paris has invented this model with, with uh, colleagues, uh, and then we kept accelerating it with another colleague, uh, Mike Joyce from Oxford, who's a specialist of uh, both UQ and, 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 and also uh, uh, fast computing on GPUs. And with Isvan uh, regularly here, but this was a, a, nice, a, a nice acceleration, so using this OP2 layer to accelerate on, on GPUs such models, which have unstructured meshes. So unstructured meshes is very nice because you can refine the mesh near the shore where the tsunami needs to be uh, modeled more precisely because the, uh, when a tsunami reaches the, so the shore, it slows down and it amplifies. So that's really important. Uh, finite volume is very efficient. It has all the three parts that I talked about. And we use it here as an example up to 125 meters the resolution. To st for, this is a part of the, of the paper on, on, the, on the code itself. Mm -hmm. so it's, we now go up down to 10 meters, and I will show you simulations at 10 meters. Uh, but you have many, obviously, you know, a large mesh, and it's complicated. This is the scaling, uh, logarithmically, by the way, uh, on these uh, GPUs or CPUs or Xeon 5. Not, not so important, but Mumbai is very interesting. So the wave can reach Mumbai. Actually, the, the picture I showed you at the beginning. Ah, where am I stuck? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I went too fast. Yeah, so this is another paper by my collaborator, Mohammed uh, Edazadeh. You can see, uh, you can maybe maybe see uh, the time it takes to reach uh, if the if, you know if the uh, earthquake happens at this location. How much time does it take to reach uh, India or Oman? Oman is very fast; it's deep ocean. The tsunami travels at the speed of a jet uh, on deep ocean, deep ocean, uh, but then slows down in uh, in shallow water. You see, so about 4.5 hours to get to Mumbai. Still a problem. I actually went to Mumbai twice, uh, especially in Navi Mumbai, this uh, new Mumbai, it's called, uh, where the city is very modern, very interested in, in doing something about it, for the fishermen especially. Uh, so this is the, the Bay of Mumbai. And, I and now I think I have to remove my uh, little mouse to, yeah, to make this happen. Uh, okay. What, what am I doing? I need to click on the screen to make the video happen. <laughs> no. There's a video here, and usually it works. Um, uh, it's, it's, it, uh, it works. <laughs> if I open the... I think maybe it's presentation mode, that's why, maybe. Yeah. So, okay, let, this is velocity, but let, let, I can start with the... The height, so minus one meter, one meter the scale, but you can see the evolution the, of the, of the in, in minutes, by the way, of the uh, tsunami entering the bay first and, and then exiting multiple times actually. So now, if I go to the to the um, velocity, I should start again. Why is it like this? So this is. Yeah, this is velocity. You see the you see the tsunami. I hope you see. Yeah, the tsunami entering the bay and with the velocity. So uh, I should use the mouse for this. So the velocity. You see the the point of Mumbai. It's a very fancy area. The one of the fanciest area of uh, Mumbai, uh, where all the actors live and so on. <laughs> you see the velocity and other another high velocity here, which is the location of the biggest port of India, the Jawal Nehru uh, Port Trust. And we, I visited, uh, with my team, we visited uh, uh, the, uh, what's, how do you call this, the captain and the port, and uh, we, we um, interacted with them because they're extending the port. And you see, if you have high velocity like this, I will go back to it, this, this can be an enormous problem for even for ships. And you can see the, the receding wave often, actually, 
uh, the receding wave creates more velocity, especially on land, because there's gravity, as you can see, also very high velocity. Another area where they are building a port for fishermen for the, for the region. Well, you can see enormous velocity. When it's clearly beyond, beyond two meters per second, it, it's a problem for the fishermen. So I'm going to stick to that mode, sorry for... What is, what is the spatial resolution of those models? Uh, from Mumbai, we were still at uh, about 30 meters, but uh, now... 30? 30. Of, of what, sorry? The boats, no, sorry. No, the, the mesh. mesh. The, the mesh. mesh, yeah, yeah, down to 30, yeah. But you don't have so so precise bathymetry no. at all. No, we with very good, very good questions. So actually, in that project, we bought hydrographic maps. It was a long project for, for that purpose. And you know, we bought 48 maps for the whole region, right? Uh, because the digital availability of uh, bathymetry is not so good there. But so, and then we, frankly, to do it by, by, by hand, to collect these numbers by hand, it was a problem. So we worked with research software engineers at ARC, really, and to create an uh, automatic uh, uh, reading of the hydrographic maps uh, with uh, neural networks, and, you know, there's a, there, there are techniques for that, to read numbers. Okay, the numbers can be uh, on top of a line, you know, isobath or something. So, Sometimes you know, it becomes a one, or that, so there's some, but still, it was very good quality, 98% correct, and then we also adjusted by hand the last. So for Mumbai, we did that, uh, for, for the whole region, actually, but we, did, we haven't used it uh, that much, but we haven't published, actually, on, on Mumbai. Uh, so just to illustrate uh, on a presentation like this, but we should. And then there's also something else, Use GMT maybe to, uh, uh, to to create surfaces. Yes, you, you know, to, to interpolate. It's very nice, but there are other techniques that we could work on. You know, with splines. And we, we had actually almost a paper on improving upon GMT for some for some regions where this. You know, but it's a very good question. Um, and this is the uh, original uh, the source of the earthquake uh, as. Uh, as the simulation. But then we went further. Oops, sorry. So maybe I can now go back to full screen. So yeah, I'll go back to why well, I think it's readable. If I, if I, I have more videos. So so 2004. Let's 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 um, move back to 2004. You remember 9.2 uh, Sumatra Andaman, the longest uh, earthquake uh, ever recorded, 200,000 deaths. Death, 31,000 in uh, Sri Lanka, about 15,000 in India. But the wave actually traveled 6,000 kilometers to Oman. It was only 50 centimeters in Oman, in the port of Salaha. And there's a very nice paper by Emil Okal on this. And this uh, ship here, 285 meters, was unmoored by a tiny 50 centimeter wave. But it's a tsunami wave, it's not a wave. It's, it's the whole ocean being uplifted. The energy is amazing. Actually, now we are working with a new way of understanding this, which momentum flux. I'm on timer, yeah. So, so I can talk about this. So you can see uh, one, of the, one of the ships, two, two ships, 285 meters, and the other one, 275 meters. So enormous ships, moored, unmoored, that went into the breakwater. You see both of them. The other one was, uh, I think, arriving into the port or something. Uh, so this is serious, serious uh, uh, type of uh, velocity in, in the sea. Yeah? So I, this is very, very interesting. So we became very passionate about this. So for um, we were think we were thinking of Karachi, the port of Karachi, which is a major port for Pakistan. Salaha is nice, but uh, you know, it's not important. And this is at 10 meters now. 10 meter resolution uh, modeling. Uh, I hope you can see the eddies being created. You can see the whirlwind, whirlpool, sorry, at the bottom here. So this is one example of a magnitude nine uh, earthquake uh, generating a tsunami that hit, will hit Karachi on the eastern part of the subduction zone. 
in creating all these eddies, you can see that they could really make a lot of damage. And you can see the units are in meter per second. So again, if you get these uh, large arrows, it's, it's, it's complicated. So we focused on that. How, how, uh, how deep is the water there for it to create four or five meters a second? Uh, how deep is the water? That's a very good question. Uh, it depends. Uh, I think this is very shallow over here. Okay. And this is quite deep, actually. But deep, I think, um, and I don't know if it's completely related to depth. Um, I don't. I don't have a full understanding of the physics creating all these complex velocities. We are observing it, but um, is there a paper on? Um, you know, is, is there a rule of thumb or something like that on the, for the velocity, the tsunami velocity, yes, there is a clear relationship with the depth of the ocean, but this is something else. This is the velocity, not of the tsunami or uh, propagation, but the, but the... Fluid particles. Sorry? Fluid particles. Yeah, exactly, yeah, in some way. So, if I moved, and it happened in uh, 2011, you remember Japan, 2011, and you can see a boat here. Uh, it happened, so yeah. uh, I mean, I'm saying maybe not to expect in Mumbai the same story, but Karachi was, so the, we published that paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, this is the paper, and where we published this, and so, okay, how did we do it? So now, compared to the landslides being created in uh, Indus Canyon, we had to generate a sample, we, we went for 300, a bit, we overkilled it a little bit, but um, a sample of events, to, uh, to to train our emulator, and we actually trained many emulators because we looked at an area of Karachi. Uh, I'll show you later the outputs. So Devraj uh, Gopinath and my postdoc did this fantastic work of creating those events according to magnitude. So you can see the magnitude uh, going down, yeah, going downwards. And then creating locations at random in this area, but you know, based on, on science, it's, it should be in the. And then creating an uplift according, according to these characteristics. The uplift is uh, based on the usual Okada uh, simplified, obviously, um, uh, relationship between slips and uplift. Uh, so, this is the, all the scaling laws that he has used to create this sample of moment magnitude and location of the training set. And why we went for about 300? Because we wanted to have enough events to capture the, you know, the, the, the very low probability ones. So can I, can I ask you a question? Please. Yeah. So when you generate the ensembles, you're, you're looking at different scenarios. And how, you, how big is your input space? Like the, what is the uncertainty about the location or the strength? Very good. Uh, of the raptures, and how do you decide on those? Things? Yeah, yeah. So there are many laws about that. You know, Gutenberg-Richter, obviously, the, for Gutenberg-Richter for the relationship between occurrences and, and magnitude. There's also this law, um, the scaling laws here between uh, length and width and, and magnitude, uh, which has has been improved uh, more recently than the standard. Uh, in the 90s, there was a, a typical law. I'm sorry, I should I should know that this by heart. Uh, but this maybe in the next slide it's explained. That. So then you know if you have a certain magnitude, you know the width and length. Uh, now you don't know the location, so you go uh, the location. Again, it's it's based on the geometry of the fault and where it should happen and can be refined. Uh, but you know, talking to experts. It's, it was it was assumed to be so uniform for, in that box. For yeah. for this one, you changed the location of the earthquake. You we changed everything: the location, the magnitude. Okay. I mean, it's not everything, obviously, but because we use, we even include sediment amplification, which is the first time it has ever been applied. My colleague Frederick Diaz has demonstrated that uh, the uplift can be increased by sixty percent with sediments that are. Uh, soft like here in this in this region, we apply that uh, 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 physically valid and empirically validated uh, law. 
which created larger events, by the way. Uh, but it's still an approximation of, uh, yeah. But you're right. So now we're getting to smaller events. So your emulator is dealing with about four? For three, three, uh, yeah, three, because it's magnitude and the two X, two X and Y. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the size of the rupture is fixed. Yeah, then it's, uh, then it's fixed accordingly. The magnitude, you see the relationship, the scanning law gives okay. you the box of uh, okay. length and width. So you travel. Uh, yeah, we made some, you can see that we made a bit of assumption here that we were, you know, step stepwise, but okay. Even these laws are not perfect in the, in the first place. And then there are so many other approximations. So we li live with that. Okay. Yeah. Yes? So th then you're modeling the whole thing at the very high resolution. Uh, no, no, that's a good question. Uh, we don't. We only go high resolution at the at, port. At the port, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, and um, that's a very good point. Actually, we did a lot of work on that. I did in the appendix. Uh, Devraj writes very deep papers that have so many, so much. That, so we have so many appendices on how to optimize. I may have a picture, but how to optimize the the non-uniform mesh. Oh, I'm, is, is it 340? I have more, about 10 more minutes, right? Yeah. yeah. So how to optimize this non-uniform mesh, you know, but you know, you have to be careful. You're gonna have many kilometers of large mesh in the deep ocean, and then suddenly very, very uh, small mesh, because uh, we have to respect, uh, you know, that the CFL condition. ECFL condition and many other uh, issues. So even the mesh has to be, uh, we use uh, G-Mesh or other techniques. You know, uh, now we use Ocean Mesh, if you like it, Ocean Mesh 2D. So, so very nice. we use it in another project on Cascadia. So this is the whole, uh, whole uh, <coughs> I just mentioned all these appendices, and, you know, the, the sediment, the deformation, the finite flow, the, yeah, whatever. And this is what we, you were just asking about, this, uh, you know, the scaling of these, uh, of these properties and so on. So. This is a deep paper, actually, in the validation of Live One Out, so we validate that we, when we remove one model output, uh, input output from the, from the set, we can you know, roughly predict the same, etc. We used a multi-output uh, Gaussian processing data, the MOGP that we created with that team that I presented at the beginning. It's still uh, in progress, the GPU accelerated. So what does it do? It's when you have the same inputs for the emulators, but you create many emulators with the same inputs, which is the case here. We have each. We'll, we'll do at each uh, out, output location. We we'll create an emulator with the same inputs, which is the earthquake source. Right. So uh, that's one aspect. Or we can do many, many more scenarios than usual. So this, let's say, software engineering acceleration has helped. So here we did a few locations, about 200 locations uh, for this paper, but one million scenarios, and I will tell you why. And we also, for Java, that we'll talk a little bit about, uh, did many locations where we want to go regional, and, and this was a humanitarian project, so you regional, but I, we, we did uh, hazard maps for this. And now, with this new project, we even connected with the Cevia toolkit, so uh, if you go online for Cevia, we have a toolkit. So Cevia is this project on UQ and, and, uh, and software engineering about that. So let's say you want to run this, these instances of the model, with different values for these parameters. Yeah, you could write yourself a Python script, blah, 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 blah. but this uh, software gives you immediately, even, even remote connections, it can deal with that with, with clusters, it orchestrates the runs, it creates folders, organized, you can even run runs at different multiple, uh, multiple fidelities, for example, so it organizes that too. So this is nice, and MOGP is connected, so it's called FAB MOGP. FAB SIM3 is the original uh, generic toolkit uh, uh, element for that. So yeah, I don't think you see much, but these are the predictions of, uh, I think it's this uh, velocity and height, yeah? Uh, and each of these locations, so we didn't do all the mesh points here, we, we were just doing a grade of emulators, but you can see the, the possible risk. I'm going to go fast because I want to focus on one aspect. Why did we do one million predictions? Because if we do only 10,000, you can see the tail, because the, you see the, this is a log scale, because of the Gutenberg low probability, high impact events. So 
to have to uh, to be able to assess the uh, you know accurately the the value of these uh, probabilities, you have to go further. One million, you know, for these very low probability events. So we were able to afford one million predictions with the with the MOGP. Cascadia can talk a little bit very shortly about this. This is the really big one since we're in the US. If you have read the New Yorker, I don't know if you have heard of this uh, New Yorker uh, article about the really big one, not the big one. You, you know the big one, uh, supposedly, the San Andreas. This is the really big one. Uh, 19, uh, so 1700, the last event, 26 January. It, it was, uh, it's, a, it's a paper in 96 in Nature by Kenji Satake in Japan who inverted from Japan what, what people have, had, had observed, a long, uh, sorry, far field event they had, you know, written in old Japanese uh, stuff, and he went backwards and found that there was a tsunami of enormous size in 1700. The next one is due. Uh, it's roughly due. It's, there's a 10% probability in the 50 in 50 years. If it happens, it would kill about, you know, 15,000 people, similar to to uh, to Japan. Uh, Let's say maybe half of the hospital, hospitals will be destroyed, uh, the police stations. It's it's dramatic. So, fortunately, um, there's in the U.S. There's a big effort to create routes for evacuation, build resilience. In Canada as well, I work a lot on the Canadian aspect for insurance. Uh, I'm jo I'm showing British Columbia the. This is old 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 work, but older work at lower resolution, but showing the impact it could have on, uh, on uh, the parliament of British Columbia. <laughs> if you want to influence policymakers, show what happens to them. You know, you remember uh, in the 19th century, the great stink in, in, in London, I mean, not the great stink, sorry, that was even later, but the, the fact that uh, people were dying in London of uh, diseases and so on, uh, you know, 14,000 sometimes. It, the, the government took action when they were in charge. This is me uh, some time ago, I had, I had hair still. But one of these simulations, we do it in 3D on a screen that there's, I don't know if you have such screens here to visualize outputs of computer models in 3D. It's, it's, it's fabulous, you can touch this, the wave. This is Grace Harbor in, uh, in, in uh, I think it's in, in um, the state of um, Washington. Uh, which would be hit by you know, possibly even 30 meters. And this is the long, we are very lucky with the, uh, an American team that had evidence of past events to about 20 in, in this. So I'm going to skip that because of time. Yeah, As this is an, an application again of, of uh, modeling the, uh, emulating and therefore creating future events but using the whole time series. So this is a very statistical paper because we, we had multiple techniques to represent the whole curve of the output. So the, the uplift was a similar story. Uh, I'm going to skip the mathematics of it, yeah? But we use what's called functional data analysis, so a bit like the principal component analysis in regular statistics, but functional with smoothness. Uh, if we do that to represent the outputs of this emulator, we, we do better okay. and we, we can propagate, but that's only to the maximum. Let me skip that. And we did another paper that just, uh, no, not just, uh, uh, at the end of 2021 was published for Cascadia. So if you were interested in Cascadia, you can look at this. We have more details about the impact at, at some, look, some shores and the prediction, so that's nice. We're writing another paper now, full, full paper on the impact on the whole region, not just locally. And to finish, the uh, back to landslides. And what am I speaking about? Now, this is work in progress, not, uh, not even submitted. I mean, we have the results, so uh, about to be submitted. We're writing the paper, maybe next week submitted. Uh, this, is, this is the region of the center of, the, of, um, of Indonesia. Where the capital, the capital of Indonesia is around here, Jakarta, and Jakarta is sinking. Uh, it's, and the subsidence is terrible, and the population is uh, is overcrowded. So the government has decided this year to move the capital to East Kalimantan, you know, about around here, Balikpapan, nearby Balikpapan, a bit a bit further up. They're still planning, so there, you know, there's room for advice. 
And this is a region where uh, there's evidence of landslides as well. But now it's a bit more complicated than for Indus Canyon. So this is the region that we identified and with collaborators, uh, a team of collaborators, again, Mohammed Dazadeh. And How deep is the water there? Sorry? How deep is the water in the strait? It's uh, not very deep, I thought. I think it's not deep. Uh, on the, this is, this is uh, shallow, but I think it goes down to maybe 2,000 meters, but I'm not completely so sure. Again, it's a good question. <laughs> but it's quite sharp, yeah. It can create volumes of about up to 600 uh, kilometer cube, which is uh, very large. Yeah? So then, this, so on the left is the region of interest, which, which has evidence of past landslides. This is the design of experiments for the computer experiments. Again, very expensive landslide uh, modeling. We use another software that Jaguar. So, so what does each point represent there? Location. Location. And volume. So the color represents volume. So that means, for example, in that, in that location, we had one very big event you see in black of about 600 kilometer cube. And nearby, you know, we created a, a sample that samples that as space. much as, yeah, you know, the, the Latin epicube business of, of trying to cover the space as much as possible. You don't want to do grids because you don't explore in all dimensions simultaneously. So that's what we did. And then we, with this kind of Latin epicube, we, this Latin aperture we re-twisted into the, into the locations and the, and, the, and the volume. And on the right is the actual predictions we made based on the emulator created. Okay, so, oh, so you only have like tens of samples in, in column B. Yeah, about 50 and here 2,000. Okay. Uh, sorry, on the right is not yet the emulator, it's the, what will be given to the emulator as input on the right. Like so these are these are input parameters, input input location, input uh, volume. Two thousand. Yeah. Okay. And then this is the uh, resulting. Maybe I can go back to full screen for people to see. If I'm going to take a risk, but maybe let, let's see if it works. Yeah, it's a risk. Oh yeah, it's a risk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's stick to that for now. Yeah, sorry for if people are online. Um, no, it's, it's good. It's okay. Yeah, so this uh, many interesting part. Uh, so on the right side, actually the, the tsunami propagates much faster because it's deep, but the heights can be up to five, six meters. You see that maybe ten meters sometimes, but really typically in the three, four meters, which is already dramatic. Huh? The the two, the 2008 where there was one one event in 2018 here, which was only two meters. And killed hundreds of people. Uh, into, uh, the, the one I, one of the ones I talked about before. Now, if if you go on the other side, the place where the new capital will be, we we go up to uh, about 12, 15 meters. You know, I mean, for very rare events. Now, how likely are those events? I think we can be sh relatively sure that it's very rare, but still, you know, still, what is to quantify? It? And then there's one, one location where it goes up to 50 meters here because it's very close to one possible large event. But that's probably a bit pushing it. And then I will skip that because there's no time, but how to, impute, how to use multiple resolutions of the runs in order to even reduce the computer model costs. So that's multiple scales running at different resolutions than model typically. So we did that. Okay, let's skip the statistics again. But, you know, you can... So sequential design, we did that for, for the latest Cascadia. Oh, you instead of one snapshot design, like I showed you, like for the, all these points, you can do a, a few runs and then think, oh, where's the next batch going to be? What's optimal? We have a technique that we published in 2016. It was the most cited paper in Science GMQ over that period of 2015-20. Because there's interest in reducing the cost, right? So. So that's called MICE, multiple, mutual information for computer experiment. So where you know you go next, that's with one resolution. You go, you find a, a, a criterion to, to know where you sample next. Now across levels, across resolutions, we with my PhD student Ayao uh, Arara, we we publish this in computational geoscience, and we, there's another multi methodology paper that's accepted, where we go by you know we go criterion, but uh, a sequential design, but also where in terms of uh, resolution, do you go next? So you see, you, you can travel like that. 
And the cost, obviously, is very important. Uh, if, if the highest resolution is level L, you don't want many runs at that resolution. OK, so there are many, uh, many aspects of the technique, da, 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 where I do it, and how many runs, you should have many runs of the low resolutions, fewer of the high resolution to make it efficient, obviously. We have some toy examples. We do better. We apply this, and we published in computer, computational geoscience for, for Java, for South Java. Again, another subduction zone, and and we we play with different parameters here. We uh, sorry, there's a parenthesis missing, but we play with slip, longitude, latitude, but we fix the rest. There's some empirical relationship with that, and we cr we show the impact it has on these locations at, in the city of Chilachap in, in in South Java. This is the sample again uh, that we created as a result. So there are three colors. Because, uh, let's say, if you look at slip and longitude, you have many runs of the low resolution in green, and then uh, more, uh, more, but I'm sorry, less, but not that many of the medium resolution in yellow, and very few of the high resolution. And it's actually very efficient. Yeah. So in this, in this, in this area, the earthquakes are known to be slow earthquakes. I'm not really sure. Well, I know a little bit what it is, but not very well. But um, that would affect a lot, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a good, good point. I'm not uh, okay, uh, a geophysical scientist, but this, yeah, the slower, the more damage for so the, the more tsunami genic, right? And there's even strike slips that could be tsunami that are uh, tsunami genic, and it depends also on the bathymetry. If you have if you have mounts, if you have sea mounts, and if you move them like this in a strike slip, you create a tsunami. So there's a lot of complexity uh, in the generation. The generation, uh, we have not discussed that much. Uh, the, the rupture velocity, the, uh, also we have a paper on, on 2004 inverting that. So the rupture velocity and the rise time also. So all these, all these speed as, uh, velocity aspects of the earthquake are key in creating a, a wave that's very powerful or not. Yeah. So you don't consider that we, in this type of models at yeah, all? Here we don't. You know, here we don't. We yeah, mm. no, we don't. Yeah, right. Here we went for, but in other papers we do. Before, mm -hmm. yeah. It was mostly this is this is a computational geoscience like to demonstrate that this technique of using multiple resolutions work in a realistic example. Is it fully realistic? No, you're right. It's realistic enough for the purpose. And then uh, this is to just to show the si one simulation, let's say, and then show the difference between if we use an emulator uh, to create uh, with multiple level, we, we can almost replicate that particular simulation that we, uh, we took out from the from the sample. And using a single level, in the same budget but only high resolution modeling, we fail. And uh, this is again the same story, longitude, latitude, slip, uh, and then the impact it has on these gauges, but I can skip that. And the same for the creating percentiles of uh, possible impacts. I fin I'm finished, please give me two minutes. Oh, no, yeah. But just with impacts on people, risk, what's called catastrophe modeling, which is used in the insurance industry a lot, and now we're using for humanitarian purposes. So these are models, they are, uh, Combining hazards, so how frequent are the hurricanes typically? They, it's very much used in hurricanes, but in earthquakes, very little in tsunami. Vulnerability, how does the house resist to the earthquake or the you know, buildings typically? Exposure, where the, what is the portfolio? And then policy, how much do we reimburse? And then the loss. So if insurers can de determine the premiums accordingly. Now we used to be twisted. The, this is an open source model actually. That's like the insurance industry in London, has decided, I mean, so many members have decided to open open that, that, bo that, that box of cat modeling. This, this is the Oasis loss modeling framework, which is open access. We used it, we collaborated with these people. I mean, we don't have to collaborate. And this same city of Chulacha that I showed before, here we have actually settlements from satellites. Actually, there are many, uh, you know, you, humans uh, settlement layers. And this is an example of an inundation from a tsunami, one scenario. And in combining that with the assets that people lose, typically in a tsunami, from other studies, from uh, economics, creating a vulnerability function of what the, the impact is, according to the wealth of these little uh, sub-districts, etc., we, we were able to create what's called exceedance probability curve, EP curves, that were, again, in, in, in insurance 
uh, that's what they use. And you can see the, this is my last slide, don't worry. Uh, this is the type of curve, I mean, they're not always straight like this, they can be a bit different. But um, this is the asset loss, okay, the rupiah is, a, the in Indonesian rupiah is very tiny, it's like 0 0.0006 dollars or something like that, so we're talking trillion. But the impact for a 1,000 year event, or kind of equivalent in, in terms of probability, would be about, for this, for just South Java, would be 360 million. Now, if we have a longer, we have also done a Sumatra. We're writing a paper on Sumatra as well, which is higher, the impact. If we have, again, a Sumatra Andaman rupture, it will go above the fund set up by the World Bank in Indonesia. They set up a fund for disaster pooling, with kind of reinsuring themselves at 500 million US dollars. And, you know, population growth, economic growth, etc. So, so we have to be careful. We are, you know, so this is this is really about uh, identifying the risk, coming up with policies that are smart, also in terms of social uh, social aspects. So typically, the government in Indonesia in Indonesia gives away a fixed amount, depend you know just two three fixed amount, but they could go for a, a policy that's uh, towards the poor or towards the reinvestment, etc. We are in discussions. We had an event in Indonesia in November. We are talk, talking to uh, Indonesian partners. Even the use of um, what's called uh, early warning systems. Also, they are setting up, you know, early warning systems. They still, you know, they had set up after 2004 with the help of the German government a, set, uh, a whole set of boys, etc., center. But many have fallen apart, and so on. So they are thinking of different system and the value of such a system. If you warn enough, if you prevent, if you make cities more um, resilient, you could not tap into that fund that much. You could also save lives, obviously. Uh, we have another paper, I mean, the, the second paper on Sumatra will have health impact as well, the out-of-pocket expenses, which are not that much, actually, turns out. And then we focus on asset because uh, incomes is not the case. Incomes typically rise after a uh, Disaster. If you remember Katrina, Katrina in, the, in Louisiana, because of the uh, yeah. yeah, because there's a lot of government money to re rebuild, and uh, there were shortages of uh, you know occupation and so on. So here we found the same. We were for for six months. We wasted time. We were for, we for income. No income rise. Typically, I mean, okay, many people lost family members. It's it's another story, but asset, which is all here, here it's all assets. It's, Personal, it's you know the chickens in the in the in the farm, the uh, business assets, uh, you know the jewelry. Uh, so well, so that's my last slide. It's I hope uh, I covered many right. many interesting aspects. And thank you, thank you, Steph. Thank you. Anybody have questions? I have. So when you're doing this, you essentially took the probability density function of the outcomes and pushed them through the CAT model. Yeah. Well, actually, almost. We don't. We, we actually we take the event set. So the hazard model. We, so this, these models are based on on um, binning events. The vulnerability is also uncertain, by the way, in this model. So you bin. It's a statistical model. Uh, so you bin, and you create an event set. And the and this model, the, this particular cat, cat model, you call it, draws keeps drawing from all these bins, right? So it's also like a Monte Carlo type. It is Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo type sampling. Yeah, it is Monte Carlo, and you have enough, you have to have enough events, enough description, enough bins really in the vulnerability, and you know you have to have uh, something meaningful. But it's not. Uh, so the emulator is very useful for. Yeah, to create the as a hazard set, because you want to create a. Ref a if you have only 50 runs of the computer model, That's you will not have a nice description of the of the possibilities, right? So you, you're, we ha we did our first paper that I cited from 2021 had only 25 events, and we acknowledged the reviewers obviously uh, mentioned that and it, it was a proof of concept that one can do such work badly, maybe. I mean, 25 events. It was not bad, but it was uh, just to illustrate. Barely capture. Yeah, just to show the that probability. We, the paper was mostly about the vulnerability. Like, how? Huh? It is a new form of vulnerability. Economic impact on people, livelihoods. Right. Uh, this is not a. 
And this is not what the insurance industry is. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to change my sentence. The insurance industry, through the Insurance Development Forum, that supports us, and others are interested in, in, uh, in, in coming up with uh, you know, uh, uh, humanitarian uh, impact on, on, on populations. And they are interested, and you know, they, have a, they have a heart too. <laughs> okay. But also, it's, it's, it's nice. Yeah. Yes? I was wondering if you could comment a bit on the, how, the, how the emulator would scale up. So let's say if it didn't take as long to run the tsunami models, uh, how many more parameters could you, let's say, add or think about varying? Very good question. How does that scale? Very good question. So you can complexify the input space, and so there are many. So typically, the rule of thumb is you need to, to train an emulator of that, of that type. You need about ten runs per dimension of the input space. It's kind of a rule of thumb, but because there's a nice paper that explains a bit. Obviously, if it's if it's a very simple relationship, but if it's complex relationship that you, you, need, you need a bit more. I mean, that's why we're always in this safe space of, let's say, 50, 60 runs for three parameters or something like that. But, okay, that, that. but now you can complexify, indeed. So if you want to use uh, other aspects of the, the, the other descriptors of the input, uh, you can go more complex. Um, Is that thinking about it as but, like 10 to the third or 10 plus 10 plus 10? It's a, it's a plus, yeah. No, not to, that's the beauty. But, but then the dimension of the input space, that's why we wrote a paper on dimension reduction. So for example, in that paper on dimension reduction, we looked at the tsunami example, which was the bathymetry. We, we, we said the bathymetry can be unknown. And actually it's true at some locations. So how do we account for this unknown bathymetry? There's a nice paper by others that have looked at, you know, if you don't know that there's a canyon here that focuses the wave, or if you know it, it changes completely the picture. And there are many, Nearshore shore three, uh, especially in those countries, that are not known well. So we did that for a toy problem, not for a full. Uh, but then the input space is an input space of size maybe 3,000, because this was a simpler example with 3,000 mesh. Uh, uh, so 3,000 triangles in that mesh that we... So, so that's, you know, if you have a surface as an input, or if you think of climate, it's the same story, you know, like, surface temperature for a notional atmosphere module as an input or something like that. Okay, so you have a surface, but so what we did, we used dimension reduction, very, it's not our method by the way, in the first place, Kenji Fukumizo in Japan and others. So we made use of that in that context of creating an emulator, this dimension reduction technique. We could go from 3,000 to 3 or 2 or 5, I mean something like that. It worked. Okay, it was quite symmetric. I, I don't claim, but I've, wait, I've been working uh, on, in two other instances for other problems. Uh, you know, one is atmospheric, and one is, uh, yeah, two atmospheric actually. And it seems to be quite efficient, this dimensional reduction. So you, you don't want to have a very high dimension as like, like a field as an input. You, you, you do, I mean, you, you, if you have, you have. But you do want to di to reduce that dimension using some technique. I mean, this technique of what's called active source space. There's, I'm not the only one working on this. You know, there are many people. Uh, there's a new paper from another collaborator who has used combined that with neural network because they are very nonlinear, etc. Um, but typically, fields. It's it, that's what you have as a boundary condition and as an input. Yeah. So. Um, that's a good question, yeah. But you, there are solutions. Um, yeah. Right. Well, we can yeah. probably terminate and continue this off. Uh, uh, wait, uh, Arthur in Zoom, did you have a question or did you just switch your camera on? Uh, uh, thank you for the uh, seminar. It was very enjoyable. Hey, a quick comment. Uh, so you're doing these million realizations and getting some really good estimates of uh, probability density functions. Has anybody tried fitting um, the probability density function that comes out of extreme value theory to your simulated distributions uh, to see what distributions would be good for extreme value theory? Uh, no, nobody has done that. It's a good idea. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> 
And yeah, I, I know you're doing a lot. You something something that a student probably could do fairly easily. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a good. Uh, if I go back to this, uh, some of these distributions. Yeah, because to extrapolate in some way to understand what what could be. Okay, I have. Oh yeah, one of these, for example. Or right, one of those. Yeah. You know, you, you fit, for example, the location, the spread, and the shape parameters. Mm -hmm. Uh, to these distribution using the various you know yeah. fitting techniques that that's out there, and maybe they'll be useful in determining which is the final you know distributions based on you know the value of the shape function parameter. Yeah. And actually, it's even it's, it's even smarter, right? Because you could even reduce uh, the need for so many samples if you already catch the to the extreme value theory. You catch the the behavior of that PDF in some way. Um, right. Yeah, if you're looking for the extremes. Okay, that's, that's also a thing, yeah. Are we looking for the extremes? Uh, are we looking for the largest event or the second largest or whatever? Or are we looking for... Well, depends. normally in that theory, theory, they're looking for return levels at some specific return period. For example, exactly. what do you expect in the one in 100 year storm or the one in 20 year storm? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, this is, uh, yeah, here we are. That's, that's the number, you know, they're looking for. Yes, yes. This is, uh, yeah, this is a possibility of looking for, uh, the, you know, what could be the, these large events here. Focusing on these large, large values, extreme values, yeah. Because here we, we, we also care about the, the, we care about the whole distribution, let's say. We, we're mostly right. interested okay. in, uh, yeah, but uh, you're right, yeah. It's very nice. Is it done for uh, other uh, other areas like hurricanes? Is, is people have done that? No. I think they do it for uh, storm surge. Probably. Storm surge. Okay. Yes, there, there's been a lot of modeling on uh, storm surge, precipitation events, uh, cold events, warm events. There's a lot of examples in meteorology. Uh, yeah, I should look into this. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Okay. Yes, yeah, sir. Sorry, morning. These extreme events is really that what matters, isn't it? I mean, you you well, said you're going to use in somehow Gutenberg Richter, but we know exactly well Gutenberg Richter is fine as long as it doesn't get so big. And when it's big, then it doesn't it doesn't it, it doesn't it, it apply. departs in some way, right? Yeah, it's it's more uncertain the the relationship. That's what you said. Well, we know it doesn't work for the biggest one. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's it's, it's troublesome. No, I agree. I agree. But, but that's the best, probably, what we can do. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's the best we can do. But it's the. Yeah, maybe we could we could make use of uh, again the uncertainty about that relationship. I thought I thought we probably did once that that the fact that well yeah you're right it may depart from the that's that uh, that kind of linear relationship kind of. Yeah, I would I would do something wondering yeah. exactly. Yeah, so you could widen that and then probability say with how yeah. to ad how to address the lack of information about the yeah. biggest events. Somewhere. Yeah, actually, that, actually, uh, yeah. I remember I didn't elaborate on this, but we we put some we did something like that, not fully, but you know, with this there's a cutoff that we assume for the magnitude that where the fit is okay or not, you know. So we play with that cutoff in this paper from 2021. But we didn't do what you suggested. Actually, we could because this is another parameter to add to the to the to the Perfect. set of uh, parameter. You know, let's let's catch all sorts of uncertainty, Epistem epistemic. But that's what you're saying. Scientific, a lack of scientific knowledge about these largest events. By the way, Japan 2011. The whole community uh, of Japan, which is very strong, <laughs> you know, nobody expected to hardly anybody. <laughs> yeah, the whole community was was surprised yeah. and could not predict that. And Sumatra and the man was also a bit uh, on the. And we're talking about two events in the last you know twenty years. So, so this is a lot. Uh, so we have to think about the epistemic uncertainties. Yeah, much much more. Uh, this is inspiring. Yeah, I, I, I think I. I'm going Just to the Tonga volcano, volcano last year, we didn't expect it at which all. Right? The Tonga volcano, which also created yeah. quite, a, quite a storm, we didn't expect something like that. There's lots of stuff which we don't expect. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. But we should, we should be scientifically equipped, hopefully, to... to okay. All right. So I have more questions, but we can do it maybe in a different setting, or, uh, yeah. or we, we can, just continue? I think we should probably let the people on, yeah. on Zoom go, and we can continue talking.
people want to leave the room, that's fine too. All right. Yeah. Okay. Then thank you. Um, so this will be the place where I will uh, end the video, right? Okay. And so now we can we can just continue to chat. Yes. Thank you so much for all the questions. <laughs>